صداقت اسلام کچھ بھی ہو جائیں گے ہم جہاں بھی کے جانا پڑے جائیں گے ہم جہاں بے کے جانا پڑے ہمیں بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم and welcome to uh, Beacon of Truth In the recent past, uh, we've seen that Muslims around the world faced yet another trial when their beloved master and prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa وسلم, was portrayed in jest and was ridiculed in a very insulting manner uh, through a video which was aired on, uh, which was shown on the internet. And this was all done through the falsely yet widely accepted notion of uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and this was... Uh, Yet it wounded, I mean, despite all this, yet despite all the freedom of speech slogans which these people raise, it wounded the sentiments of millions upon millions of Muslims around the world. However, on such occasions, we've seen that the MDM Muslim Jamaat always gained the opportunity to show to the Muslim world and the world at large what the reaction of a true Muslim should uh, be, according to what the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has taught us. And we've seen, I mean, we've learned from our master, our founder of the MDM Muslim Jamaat, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadiyan, wasalam, that we shouldn't, I mean, at such times when we are, where we're being attacked, or even in neutral positions, we shouldn't attack uh, the the other religions, their gods or their beliefs, because obviously it is the Quranic injunction not to attack those religions, lest they attack your gods, the true omnipotent God, uh, back. And um, obviously we should so show to the world through this that they couldn't be uh, further from the truth. Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the supreme head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, may Allah strengthen his hand, has consistent, con continuously in his Friday sermons uh, pointed towards this, that we should present the beautiful image of Islam and show to the world that they couldn't be further from the truth. And we see that on the 21st of September 2012 and in the coming Friday sermons, he spoke about this specific issue when a video was shown on the internet and he responded in the best possible manner that a Muslim leader uh, could have uh, done so. Uh, inshallah, in today's program, we aim to look at why do we love the Prophet? Because we've seen that there are so many peoples and so many faiths in the world, yet they do not seem to hold that same reverence or respect or show that high esteem for their um, prophets or leaders as we, the Muslim Ummah, show for our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. This is a live program, uh, obviously like the previous two programs, um, this is live and an interactive program. So if you do have any questions which you'd like to ask them, please don't hesitate in sending them in on the contact details being shown on the screen, because obviously this platform has been opened up for your benefit. And if you do have any questions which are lurking in the back of your minds, which you haven't been able to ask, please do uh, ask them in today's program. And inshallah, uh, the panel with us here today will uh, answer them in due course. Uh, with us, uh, um, today in the studio we have with us uh, Abdul Qudus Arif Sahib, Shehzad Ahmed Sahib and Farhad Ahmed Sahib who inshallah will be answering uh, the questions. Uh, Shehzad Sahib, I'd like to start off with you. Um, we've seen that in the past whenever attacks have been made against Muslims, I mean the reaction of Muslims has always been something significant and you can you know, tell from miles away that there is something going on. Why is there such a big reaction? You first have to understand that what does the Holy Prophet of Islam mean to a Muslim? See, the love that we as Muslims have for the Holy Prophet of Islam is extremely deep-rooted. And there is nothing in the world that can supersede that love. So it's obvious, it's, it's quite obvious and very natural that whenever such vile publications or offensive remarks are levelled against the noble character of the Holy Prophet of Islam, the Muslims will strongly react and opposed to him. However, having said that, nothing can justify the storm of violence that we have seen swell across the world, particularly in the Muslim countries. Now, the present head of the Amdiya Muslim community, Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih Khamis, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Salizis, responding to these shameful acts, he, in one of his recent sermons, stated, and I quote, he said that, for how long will you continue observing such vulgar and obscene acts? For how long will you go on protesting and causing damage and destruction 
only to fall silent thereafter. This will have no effect upon the Western world or on the producers of the film. It is completely contrary to the teachings of Islam to attack innocent people in Western countries, to threaten them or attempt to kill them and attack their embassies. Islam does not permit this in any way, shape or form. This was the Friday sermon that was delivered on <coughs> the 21st of September 2012. And also the promised Messiah والسلام, has time and time again told us that the <coughs> attack of, by the pen should, al should be only defended by the pen also. And also having said this, we the followers of uh, the Holy Prophet of Islam, we adhere to the Quranic teaching that لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله, that we do not draw any distinction between the messengers of God. Therefore, whenever such uh, offensive remarks are made against any of the holy founders of their respective religions, we as Muslims, our sentiments are equally hurt. Right. And obviously, we're talking about you know attacks against Islam. We've seen that whoever attacks Islam, I mean, they it shows that they don't have that knowledge, and their knowledge is very shallow and hollow. Because I mean, obviously, last. Uh, time on Beacon of Truth, we spoke about Islam, uh, The Untold Story, which was a documentary aired on Channel 4, and Tom Holland, who scripted and uh, researched about this, um, we sent him some of the clips from the program which we uh, broadcast li uh, live uh, in, uh, two weeks ago. And we sent him some clips, and in response to that, Tom Holland said that I'm still firm in my views. Uh, and in response to that, we said, then there's no other option than to, you know, debate, have a debate, and we'll give our um, arguments, you present your arguments, and thus we'll conclude what is, I mean, let the viewers conclude what the truth is. Uh, truth is. And he plainly declined and said, no, uh, I said what I had to say on uh, that documentary. So we can see, I mean, that, <coughs> excuse me, that even today when uh, historians are present presented or whoever asserts allegations against Islam, when they're presented with the truth and they understand that the truth is you know, becoming manifest now, they completely close their case and say sh they shut all the books on themselves and say that we don't want to open our case any further. Jazakallah uh, Shahzad Sab. Kudusa, we just heard that Muslims have a deep-rooted uh, love within them for the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, the question arises, why is there such a love? Exactly, Qasid. As you've mentioned that every Muslim claims to have a great love, a true love for the Holy Prophet But majority of these Muslims, majority of us do not understand this love or cannot comprehend it. So as you put it, Qasid, then why do they show so much speci special, why they have the Holy Prophet so close to their hearts? That's the question. Is it due to some sort of custom that has been passed on from generation to generation? Or is it, as Shazad said, something deeply rooted? Well, for a Muslim to believe in the prophets is part of their articles of faith. As the Quran so distinctively <coughs> says, Kullun amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasuli, that all the faithful believe in Allah, believe in his angels, believe in his holy scriptures, and believe in his prophets. So that individual who brought this very teaching has to be credited. But our love for any of the prophets is not just due to an injunction in the Holy Quran, but we have to truly appreciate what they have given to the world, the revolution they caused in the world. See, history bears witness to the fact that before the advent of these prophets, the areas they came to, they were suffering, in, they were in great distress, they were in great uh, turmoil. And after they came, there was a great revolution. And the Holy Quran actually <coughs> portrays this very turmoil, this very distress in the following words. The Quran says, Dhahr al fasadu fil barri wal bahr. That turmoil, destruction, had manifested itself in the sea and the land, meaning that there was no spiritual or worldly progress left in the world. And that spiritual and worldly progress, the light was so dimmed, if not darkened completely, and the world was encapsulated with this. It's a time and time again this happens. This is the way of Allah. And that is why we see that at the time of Buddha, at the time of Krishna, at the time of Confucius, Zoroaster, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, this was the case. God said, if I was to say, this was the case at least 124,000 times in the world, that before a prophet comes, before his advent, the world is in great, it speaks for itself, it cries out for a reformer to come. And these areas actually were crying out for a reformer. So the next question will be, what is the difference between the Holy Prophet 
Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all those past prophets. It's simple that those prophets who were in the past, they had come for a particular nation, for a t particular time, and their teaching was limited to that particular time frame. Their enlightenment was limited to that time frame. But the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the only prophet, and God Almighty made him profess the following statement, inni Rasulullah alaykum jamia, inni Rasulullah alaykum jamia, that surely I am a messenger of God unto all of you, unto all of mankind. And, the, and God Almighty then made, uh, made it clear to the world by saying, Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum, that today I perfected for you for your faith. Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, and I have completed my favor upon you, wa radhitu lakum al Islam adina, and I preferred for you <coughs> Islam as a faith. Now, meaning that the perfect teaching, the perfect guidance is the Holy Quran. And the perfect teacher and the universal teacher is the Holy Prophet In conclusion, Qasid, that we've actually understood the respect, the honor, the reverence for all the prophets through the teachings of the Holy Prophet through the Holy Quran. So that is why we love the Holy Prophet <coughs> and that is why he's so beloved to us. Exactly. I mean, we're talking about the love of the Holy Prophet We have to understand that obviously when we love the Holy Prophet there is something significant about him which he you know, overtakes all of the other prophets in, uh, obviously being Khatam and Nabiyyin. Um, we have, I mean, there, I mean, he was, uh, you know, there's a reason why we love, revere, respect him and hold him in such high esteem. I mean, he was that person who, <coughs> excuse me, brought the perfect teachings, the perfect book, the perfect example for human beings to follow. And uh, I mean, one historian said um, that it was, Islam was never its own entity and that everything which uh, has been given before Islam, Islam has taken that and Islam, you know, it was never, it was a continuation basically of everything which came before. I mean, he was correct in saying that, but he was false at the same time because he was correct in saying that it was a continuation because Islam has taken, I mean, the belief of unity and the oneness of God Almighty, the oneness of a community, the oneness of a leader from the other religions and it's continued. I mean, obviously the if the message is going to be the same from God Almighty, in effect, the mm -hmm. message would always continue with the prophets. The Quran is so clear where it says Qutub al that all those teachings of the pra past holy scriptures, all those teachings that were rational to the mind, that could be practiced, <coughs> which was in accordance with human nature, they've all been accumulated in the Holy Quran. Right. And all those past prophets, they've all been accumulated, their attributes have been accumulated in the Holy Prophet Exactly. And uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, coming back to that historian, he said that Islam was never its own entity. It was false in saying that because Islam presented, like I said, the tr the, the perfect image, the perfect book, like you said, al yama akmaltu lakum dinakum, that today, this day, I perfected for you uh, your religion. And in that, God Almighty has said that all the other religions, which, I mean, Hazrat Muslim, or the second successor of the promised Messiah, Hazrat Musa Bashir al Mahmud Ahmad Saad, may Allah be pleased with him, in his uh, book, Islam, uh, Introduction, uh, uh, Introduction to the Study of the Holy Quran, in that he said that Islam acted as a tributary for all other religions. I mean, all other religions were streams which would eventually lead up into the tributary of uh, Islam. So, uh, Jazakallah for that, uh, Quddu Sahib. Farhad Sahib, um, Historians usually take the life of the Holy Prophet وسلم, out of context and they don't usually keep into account the, you know, the atmosphere at that time. Can you please tell us about I mean, the social setup of Arabia, of the pre-Islamic Arabia? What was it like at that time? Yes, um, looking specifically at Arabia, which was the land where the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came and a land which was to go on and be the source of an extraordinary revolution within the earth. We have to see what the state of that land was prior to the advent of that man who caused this amazing revolution which, was, which the world hadn't seen before and still hasn't seen the like of yet. Now politically speaking, Arabia was a land which was largely ignored by the m majority of the civilizations at the time. For instance, in the east you had the um, uh, Persian Empire and in the west you had the Roman Empire they did not really care much about the Arab, Arab Peninsula because Arabia could not offer them anything that they were interested in. And this has been highlighted by Tim Wallace Murphy who is, a, who is an author and uh, he's a renowned author and is also a historian. He mentions in the book what Islam did for us. He says that the life of the Arabs was one that condemned them seemingly perpetual isolation on the periphery of the known world, largely ignored by the great civilizations of the 7th century. Now this the reason for them being ignored 
is mainly because of the fact that they had no political organization. Arabs, Arabia was split into different tribes and each tribe was looked after by a single chief, a separate chief. And it was this, I mean, this system, this tribal system, which led to a great many problems for the Arab peoples. Because of the fact that each tribe had to look after its people and it had very limited resources to do so because of the Arab climate, it could not support too many people. And also the system was such that it could not control too many people because it lacked control. Therefore, sorry, um, therefore, it led to many vices being committed within that society because it could not control too many people. It was this reason that led to them murdering newborn baby girls because they saw them as more mouths to feed for the tribe. So for the sake of the tribe, they would even, at some tribes, would even murder their own children. And this was the extent that they had loyalty to, the, to their own tribes. Now it was also this system which led to a very negative mentality of the Arab peoples. It led to a mentality of survival of the fittest because only that tribe would survive who had the most resources, obviously. So they did whatever they could to um, provide the tribes with the uh, needed resources. For instance, it wouldn't be considered to rob other tribes. It wouldn't be considered to loot other tribes, all because you had to provide all the means necessary for the tribe to survive. Now, also what encouraged this further, this mentality further, is the fact that each tribe's laws, if it did have any, they were only confined to a certain tribe. Outside the bounds of the tribe, there was no law. So you could, in fact, uh, Karen Armstrong, who is a well-known historian, religious historian, she writes in the book that outside the tribe obligation ceased and there was no notion of a universal natural law at this stage of Arab development. So it was not considered wrong even to murder somebody of another tribe as long as there was no two ties between the two tribes. Okay. Now the only thing that was stopping people from doing this at that time was the policy of retaliation where a, where a tribe would wage war against the other tribe who murdered a member of their tribe. It was not because they respected the life of that member of their tribe, but it was because they respected the honor and dignity of their tribe. They had self-respect for the tribe. So for that reason, they would wage war against the other tribe. And this led to decades of wars being fought within Arabia for ages. Now also the fact that there was no central government within Arabia, that led to the Arabs not having any chance to ever unite, because you need a central government to do that. And also, this was the factor which was stopping them from succeeding out of their nomadic lives. Now, the moral and religious state of the Arabs was also very similar to their political and social state. For instance, there was a great lack of education. The fact that there was not a single school in the whole of Arabia points out that these people, how, how much they lacked in their education. The Arabians were very far behind the whole rest of the whole world in, their, in respects to education. Now, Arabs were also very hardened alcoholics, and this is clear from their uh, historical records from a uh, pre-Islamic era, era, which points out and which is adorned with mention upon mention of w uh, binge drinking and them being proud of being in that state of where they are totally drunk and they don't know what's going on. So Arab state of morals was very low and they were in fact proud of being in such a state. Now, one more thing that was uh, that is very shameful that was very shameful in the uh, Arabian uh, Peninsula at that time was the lack of respect they had for women. Mm. I mean, they treated them like property. A man could mani marry as many women as he could afford, and then also not just this: his son, if his father was to pass away, it was not considered wrong for him to marry his stepmothers. Now, this was the extent the Arabians had uh, fallen down d down to. Now, this was um, the poor state has been mentioned, in fact, by the Sahabas themselves, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu When they went to uh, Saudi Ar when, when they went to Abyssinia, um, they spoke to the king and told them that they explained their condition before Islam and after Islam. And they said, and they mentioned to the king that, O king, we were, we were plunged in the depths of ignorance and barbarism. We adored idols. We lived in unchastity. We ate dead bodies and spoke abominations. We disregarded every feeling of humanity and the duties of huma humanity and neighborhood. We knew no law but that of the strong. When God raised among us a man of, of whose birth, truthfulness, honesty, and purity we were aware, and he called us to the unity of God and taught us not to associate anything with him, he forbade us the worship of idols and enjoined us to speak the truth, to be faithful to our trusts, to be merciful and to regard the rights of the neighbors. He forbade us to speak evil of women or to eat the substance of orphans. Now this is scribed here 
it shows us how great a change the Holy Prophet ﷺ brought in these barbaric people. These were people who, had, who were indulged in a brutal practice of murdering the war prisoners. The Holy Prophet ﷺ caused such a change within them that they not only gave the prisoners life, but also gave them the best things they had. They, them, they themselves would eat date and dates and would give them the bread. They if, would not, if not, he gave even better than exactly, what the normal people had. Definitely. Exactly. And in fact, the uh, prisoners would be mounted on rides and the Sahaba would be walking along exactly. them. I mean, that's the kind of change that the Holy Prophet ﷺ brought within them. So we see that the Holy Prophet ﷺ poured a people who were in their dark ages out into an enlightened era all because of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And obviously you're talking about you know, the, the rights for which the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to women. I was thinking once that nowadays you know, people say that, okay, fair enough, you've, you've given rights to women, but you know, there, there are some flaws, whatever those flaws may, they may seem to think, uh, regardless of that. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave women right in such a time when women didn't even fight for rights. In this day and age, when these people say that we've given women rights, they give, they've given women rights after the demand and riots and protests and so much protest after, I mean, the women had to beg for freedom. And eventually when they got the freedom, now they had the nerve to even say that Islam gave women uh, the rights which are of a lesser degree. I mean, the Holy Prophet liberated women in such a way which, you know, they didn't even have to fight. They didn't even know that there was something wrong going on with, uh, you know, with them. They thought it was normal. Even the women considered it uh, normal at that time. Jazakallah uh, for that. Um, Dr. Wudan Sahib has asked a question from Canada. He asks that when a group of Muslims abuse other people's prophets, do they have a right? Do, the, do they have the right to protest when the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is abused? Shazad Sahib. Well, because this is uh, precisely the reason why. The Holy Quran has forbidden the uh, the Muslims from abusing any of the idols or whatever anyone perceives to be their God, because precisely for this particular reason that because they they may abuse your God in return, and so obviously when that particular thing backfires, you obviously will not like it. And for a Muslim, you see the unique quality of a Muslim is that as the verse that I quoted before was that la nufariku bain ahadim mirusuli that we respect all the holy founders of all the regions. So there is no question of a Muslim abusing any uh, prophet of God. Yeah. Or even if it says it's not a, a prophet of God, but he should not go uh, about uh, abusing them or using any harsh language against them. Because obviously, like I said, if it backfires against them, they will not like it. And a perfect example of this, if we see in modern times, was what Hazrat Masim uh, uh, left for us. And that was at the time, uh, many of the religious leaders, they were, they indulged in this, this, this sort of thing where they were abusing the other uh, holy founders of the religions. So as Masim Aldalai established this, this unique uh, formula, you can say, and he said that everyone should mention the qualities of their own respective yeah. religions and their own uh, holy scriptures. And that's it. They shouldn't go about looking at the flaws and weaknesses of other religions. So obviously, as Muslims, this is what we should do. We should respect all the holy founders. And obviously, if we believe that our prophet is the true prophet and our religion is the true religion, then we should mention the qualities of our religion and have nothing to do with anyone else as and such. I mean, all religions at one time were true anyway. So Absolutely. express the beauties of your religions because we respect the fact that each prophet came and was true in his respective time. I mean, the interpolation or perversion in religion Friendly is something which of, is of secondary nature to us. I mean, if a prophet came, we respect that and we respect the fact that he came from God Almighty. You were talking about contemporary examples, even more contemporary. I think uh, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih in a recent Friday sermon spoke about when um, Hazrat Guru Baba Nanak uh, was portrayed in a very, you know, it was ridiculed in a very insulting manner. And Hazrat, he wasn't even a prophet, but Hazrat. Um, uh, Khalifa al Masih V expressed that such pious people should not be uh, portrayed in such a manner. They should be respected. I mean, they, these people came from God Almighty and were only Allah, you know, people mm -hmm. who were very near to Allah and saints mm -hmm. and exactly uh, sages. Jazakallah for that, Shahzad Sahib. Um, Qudu Sahib, uh, we just heard from Farhad Sahib that uh, the, state, what the state of Arabia was at that time. But obviously, I mean, we say that the Holy Prophet ﷺ was sent for the entire mankind. Then what was the state of the rest of the world at that time? Obviously before Islam. Exactly. The criterion I was mentioning before about the al-fasadu fil barri wal-bahir, 
that there was this order in the land and the sea. And after this criteria is set, then Allah the Exalted manifests His enlightenment through His messengers. This was the case with the Holy Prophet as you mentioned. As he was from the entire mankind, therefore there must be some sort of disorder in the whole world. And we find that this is the very case. The, the whole world was in complete darkness and disarray. And uh, Godfrey Higgins, who's a 19th century religious historian, I'd like to quote him here. And he actually portrays the picture so well. He says, and I quote, Perhaps in no previous period had the empire of the Persians or the oriental part of the Roman Empire been in a more deplorable or unhappy state than at the beginning of the 7th century. In consequence of the weakness of the Byzantine despots, the whole frame of their government was in a state of complete disorganization and in consequence of the most frightful abuses and corruption of the priests. He continues and says, the whole frame of society was loosened the towns and cities flowed with blood. Now this is the picture that Mr. Higgins is painting, that the whole world was in darkness, was in disarray. There was murder, there was bloodshed all across the world and they were all trying to occupy different lands. This was the main target and the two great superpowers of the time, I mean, like Higgins mentioned, were the Sassanid Empire, which was in the east, i.e. the Persians, and the Byzantine Empire, Empire which was in the west, the, the Roman Empire. And both these were a continuous war with each other. Their sole purpose was land occupation and nothing else. And you, f you find that they had wars upon wars and this warfare was continuing for, uh, from de for decades. In this scenario, the Holy Prophet ﷺ came, where there was no economic, religious or um, social peace. So in other words, there was no peace or tranquility in the East or the West. Neither of the empires could help in any way. So then God Almighty sent His Prophet to the world. I mean, I would like to mention here with regards to the Christian state, John Davenport, who is a Christian uh, clergyman, he writes, and I quote, It is not easy to conceive of anything more deplorable than the condition of Christianity at this time. The scattered branches of the Christian church in Asia and Africa were at variance with each other and had adopted the wildest heresies and superstitions. He continues and says, The general barbarism and ignorance which were to be found amongst the clergy caused great scandal to the Christian religion and introduced universal profligacy of manners among the people. So in the 6th century we find that yes all the religions were there, Judaism was there, Christianity was there, Zoroastrianism was there, but they were all also prophesizing a reformer to come, such a reformer that would be universal and they had the scriptures as evidence and they had, uh, they had proof that this this man or this reformer will be coming in, the, in, in that time period. And I would like to present Martin Lings, who's an biogra English biographer, he's a contemporary biographer. He wrote, the, I think, this book in the 1980s. Uh, it's called Muhammad. And he writes with regards to this belief that a reformer was needed at the time. And I quote, There was a belief among Christians of those parts that the coming of a prophet was imminent. This belief may not have been widespread but it was supported by one or two venerable dignitaries of the e of Eastern churches and also by the astrologers and soothsayers. As to the Jews, for whom such a belief was easier, <coughs> since for them the line of prophets ended only with the Messiah, they were almost unanimous in their expectancy of a prophet. Their rabbis and other wise men assured them that one was at hand. Many of the predicted signs of his coming had already been, already been fulfilled. And we find that these very prophecies, which were in Holy Scriptures, on the past Holy Scriptures, were in fact fulfilled in the person of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in effect, I mean, the world was actually crying out for a reformer at that time. That's brilliant. Jazakallah Qudur Sahib. Um, this is obviously, I mean, I'd like to reiterate that this is a live program and obviously an interactive one. If you'd like to send us in your questions, you can email us on beacon at, uh, at mta.tv, B-E-A-C-O-N at mta.tv. Or if you'd like to send us in a phone message, you can do so on the phone number being shown on the screen, 0044 6208 And uh, you can text us or uh, fax us on the contact details being shown on the screen. Jazakallah for that, Qudu Sahib. Um, we've received quite a number of questions now. Um, Tariq Mahmood Sahib uh, has asked from London, uh, Farhad Sahib, uh, should our love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, be more than other prophets? And I think he might be referring to the verse, possibly, I mean, Yeah, surely. Um, 
we have, as you've just mentioned, the verse is telling us that la nufariqu bayna hadhim rusul that we do not differentiate between the prophets. So the respect that we have for any prophet, apart from the Holy Prophet وسلم, whom we respect as well, of course, is the same on the whole scale, of course. And that's why whenever we say the names of any prophet, we do say alayhim as mm. upon, upon all of the prophets, may there be peace of God Almighty. Now the thing is that, as you just uh, mentioned uh, just now, that the Holy Prophet وسلم, is such a river in which all the streams are flowing into. So all the prophets, all their characteristics can be judged or can be seen if we look at the life of the Holy Prophet And The thing is, all the previous teachings, they have been abrogated to a certain extent. We don't have the true image of the previous prophets because they are so old in a way that their true teaching hasn't reached us without any uh, abrogations. As in, we can't even, I mean, Islam can't nullify those religions because of the fact that they served for the th same purpose that the Holy Prophet wasalam, served. Definitely, definitely. So by looking at one prophet, we can actually see the characteristic of all of the prophets. And the reason that we love the Holy Prophet wasalam, so much is because we can see what he was like. We can see his char characteristics. And it's in fact, through the Holy Prophet wasalam, we can see the characteristics of all other prophets because they all contain similar uh, char characteristics. So just by us being given the Holy Quran and given the teaching that you should not differentiate between different prophets, it also instills a love within the Muslims that you should also love the leaders of all other prophets. And that's a great um, benefit of Islam, that Islam has done a great favor upon all other religions, that we respect all their, f uh, their leaders as well. No other religion can claim this. No, Christianity does not cl claim that we also respect the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu yet Islam is such a global religion that we can claim that we respect Hazrat, the leader of, um, <coughs> the founder of Christianity, the founder of uh, Judaism, the founder of Sikhism, the founder of Hinduism, Buddhism and so on. And that's the char characteristic of Islam which is very unique. In fact. I mean, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think in any religion any, I don't think any religion demands the love of that specific prophet. It was only through, I mean, in, in Islam that we learn how a love should, you know, love, how one should love uh, a I prophet. I think in my uh, beginning statements, I said that it's part of a Muslim's belief, you know, part of his six articles of faith to believe in the prophets and to hold them in respect and to hold them in honor. But the Quran also says, that these are the prophets. Yes, we have given some preference over some uh, compared to the others. So where it comes to respect, honor, and love, it's uh, uh, and respect and honor, it's the same. But Allah the Almighty Himself is stating that I, uh, that He Himself has given them some precedence over others. And obviously, also in the Holy Quran, it also does say. I mean, the Quranic injunction of. I mean, I think that's from where the article of faith comes from. That kulin kuntum Allah That if you uh, love Allah, then uh, then obey me. Then shall Allah love you in return. I mean, obviously, obeying uh, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the fullest is what the Holy, the promised Messiah, alayhi salam, did, and his example doesn't need to be uh, you know, mentioned time and time over and over again. It's so obvious how he loved the Holy Prophet Wasallam. I mean, he said in one of his couplets, didn't he, that um, uh, the, the, the Persian isn't coming to mind, but he said that this is such a love in my heart that even if it's, if it's disbelief, that if this love for the Holy Prophet Wasallam is disbelief, then by God, I am the biggest disbeliever. That he held such, you know, such if, such amount of love in his heart for the Holy Prophet wasallam, and I think that's an example which we all need to follow in uh, this day and age. And also, aside from that, there is the verse of Khatam al Nabiyin, yeah. which Allah, the Almighty, has given Himself the preference of the the, the, the superiority to the Holy Prophet wasallam, and has crowned him Khatam al Nabiyin. Jazakumullah, gentlemen, uh, for that. Um, Kudusa, I'd like to come back to you. I mean, there was another question from Mudassir Siddiqui Sahib from the United Kingdom. He has asked that when the Holy Prophet وسلم, claimed to be Prophet, what, what made the people accept his message? Exactly. Uh, Siddiqui sir, the fact is that we find that the world was so contaminated at the time. It was in such disorder and corruption. And the teachings of Islam were so beautiful that people were automatically drawn towards this teaching. And Islam was so pure and pristine in its teachings that people wanted to come and accept Islam. Not just this, but the morals of the Holy Prophet were such great that they were not seen at the time. 
I mean, Hazrat Khadija, his wife, Razirat Allah Anha, stated that, O Prophet of Allah, you have such morals that are not on the face of the earth. So how can God Almighty, you know, trial you in such a way when he first received the, the, the call? So, and all the people around him used to call him the truthful, the trustworthy. I mean, when a man has never lied upon his fellow beings, how can he, can, how can he expect him to lie about the exalted Allah, the, one, the omnipotent God? So this is the case that the world wasn't in corruption. They saw this beautiful teaching of Islam and they were automatically drawn towards it. And of course, the character of the Holy Prophet Exactly, Jazakallah Qudu Sahib for that concise answer. Shazad Sahib, coming back to our discussion, I mean, uh, in the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, there were many monotheistic religions uh, present at that time uh, of the uh, 6th century. But we find that there was an additional, I mean, it seems that an additional uh, monotheistic religion was just added on to, them, to that list. I mean, what was, the, what was the need for this? Well, you see, because of one of the greatest favours the Holy Prophet وسلم, had on mankind was that he brought the most perfect and universal message in the form of Islam. And this was such a teaching that could be practiced and followed in every situation and in all times to come. Now, this is particularly evident when we look at it in light of the two distinctive features that every religion has or it should have. And this is, these two features are the aspect of Adal, which is justice, and the second aspect is Ihsan, which is known as goodness. In other ways, we can explain it as this is the the social and the spiritual aspect of a religion. Now, before the advent of Islam, as you have just said, the two biggest uh, monotheistic religions were uh, Judaism and Christianity. And both of these incorporated these two features uh, to a certain extent, but with great uh, disparity and inequality. For instance, if we look at Judaism in the Mosaic law, it lays great emphasis on the aspect of adal, i.e. justice. Uh, it has the teaching that every crime should be met with a punishment. Hence it has the teaching that a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, a nail for a nail, and so on and so <coughs> forth. On the other hand, the second uh, biggest monotheistic religion, which was Christianity, it laid great emphasis on the aspect of Ihsan, i.e. on compassion and forgiveness. Hence it had the teaching that if you were slapped on uh, one cheek, then you must show the other. Now, in this situation, Islam came with the, with the most um, balanced teaching of both. It constructed a, a balance between both these as aspects, between Adal and Hassan. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that these teachings were wrong, certainly not. Because, but the fact is that they were perfect for their particular people and for that particular time. For instance, we know that the Jews, because they were held uh, for such long years in captivity, they needed a teaching that was to make them resilient and tough once again. Hence they had this teaching. But then that same teaching started to have an adverse effect on them and they became very rigid and harsh in their uh, temperament and their personality. <coughs> so they needed a teaching that emphasized more on compassion and forgiveness and mercy and that came in the form of Christianity. And that was also perfect for its particular time. But thereafter you cannot always practically apply forgiveness and compassion uh, all, all the time. It's not compatible with human nature either. So in such a situation, Islam came and constructed a, a perfect balance between both these aspects. And this is quite evident from the verse of the Holy Quran, which is Auzubillah min shaitan rajim Jazaw sayyatin sayyatun mithlwa fa man afa wa aslaha fa ajru wa lallah that the, that the, recompense, the, the recompense of an injury is an injury like thereof. But if you forgive, uh, which will bring about an improvement, mm -hmm. then your reward lies with Allah. <coughs> so in other words, the underlying principle behind the concept of punishment is to bring about a moral reformation. If it comes about by giving, handing down a punishment, then yes, a punishment should be given. But if it can come about by forgiving the person, then you must forgive him. So this was the perfect balance that Islam uh, that stroke between these two aspects. So coming back to the original question that when there are all these religions present, what is it that Islam, what is it, what is so different <coughs> and unique about Islam? What, it is, what, what, it, what does Islam present? And this is exactly what it is. Islam gives us that, that parameter and that very, that boundary within that which we can, you know, it prevents us from indulging into either of the extremes. And within that balanced framework, 
we are able to make the choices uh, relating to religious matters. Brilliant. Zakala Shazad Sab. Um, I was previously, I mean, before coming to this program, I was uh, just reading through about, you know, where I can find about the love of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I came across one part where Hazrat Muslimaud in his book, um, Invitation to Ahmadiyyat, which is a translation of uh, Dawatul Amid, he says in this book, and he defines, he says that the, the basic definition of love has been given in the Holy Quran itself. I mean, he, he says, Hazrat Muslimaud says, that the most comprehensive description of love, however, is to be found in a passage of the Holy Quran. I shall read out the translation just for the benefit of the viewers. This is Surah al Toba, uh, verse 24. <clears throat> I'll read out the translation. Has, uh, the Quran states that say, if your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your wives and your kinfo kinsfolk and the wealth you have acquired and the trade whose dullness you fear and the dwellings you love are dearer to you than Allah and His Messenger and striving in His cause, then wait until Allah comes with His judgment and Allah guides not the disobedient. So, I mean, the basic love, I mean, we're talking about the love for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the love for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Love for uh, the Holy Prophet is complete and utter devotion with uh, regards to uh, relatives, your, your wealth, your kinsfolk, and everything which you possess, you should be ready to lay that down in the Holy Prophet Sallallahu cause. And we've seen, whenever we stand up for pledge for Majlis Qudam al whether it be that, whether it be Lajna Imayla Atfalul Ahmadiyya even, uh, to Majlis Ansarullah, we always see that the thing which is given preference, the, the, the thing which is um, highlighted is sacrificing one's life, wealth, time and honour for the sake of Khilafat Ahmadiyya. And Khilafat Ahmadiyya is nothing separate from the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, Shazad Sahib, coming back to you, I mean, we've received quite a number of questions now. Muhammad Chaudhry Sahib uh, has asked, and he's from Buckinghamshire. Muhammad Chaudhry Sahib asks, um, Islam is a way of life which people in the West find difficult to adapt to, apparently. <laughs> in the time of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were people allowed to adapt to different ways? You see, with the earlier qu the, the question that you asked, the answer that I gave towards the end, I said that Islam this is the unique and beautiful quality of Islam, that Islam hasn't given any hard and fast rules, barring a few, for instance, where it has told you that you cannot uh, you know, eat uh, uh, the, the flesh of the swine, and so on and so forth. There are certain hard and fast rules, but other than that, the beautiful teaching of Islam is that it's given you a particular framework, a, b a particular parameter, and within that, you, you have the freedom of choice to make. So yes, the adapt adaptability factor is always there. There is the adaptability factor, and this is quite notable. For instance, who were the first recipients of the Holy Prophet of Islam? They were the Bedouins, they were the Arabs, who were split into many tribes, as Qadul Sahib has said. Now, within these tribes, there were different class systems and caste systems. So you had a very the elite, and you had very those at the very bottom low of the caste systems as well, who were very poor. Now, they all received and accepted the message of Islam. But nowhere did Islam say that the, those who are at the very bottom or the you know, very poor, they should dress in such a way like the rich or the rich should dress like the, the, the poor or gave a particular uniform as such. So obviously, there is the adaptability factor within Islam, which makes it so unique, which is why you know, people often ask this question that is Islam compatible with the West? In fact, Islam is. And in fact, is, is, is the West compatible with Islam? That's, That's what we exactly. need to be asking. Exactly. So the adaptability factor is there within Islam, which make which gives it that very unique quality. And the the, the permission to make Islam adaptability in one society, I was thinking, is I mean, it's pretty obvious. It, it, it requires a leadership. Where is that leadership today? Absolutely. You don't have it. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his time gave that permission of adaptability. Adaptability can't come without permission. The Promised Messiah came 1400 years after and gave that permission of adaptability. Mm -hmm. Didn't change the teachings in any w uh, way whatsoever. He adapted mm -hmm. Islam in today's modern day and age. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, he tried it. He tried <clears throat> and attempted to adapt Islam, but he didn't adapt Islam. He completely changed the teachings. He <coughs> Excuse me. He uh, went on to say that prayer is something which is <laughs> completely insignificant, and it's only something which you know f uh, fulfills one's uh, inner anguish. And gradually, a person calms down and says, "Okay, you know, 
I don't know if the God's there listening to me, but it's calmed myself down just for just by expressing what I needed. In this day and age, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih, the fifth male of strength in his hand, uh, in his Friday sermons, always addresses these issues. I mean, addresses the issues of how to adapt Islam in this day and age. And I was thinking, there's a good example of the life of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the rich people were giving more sadaqat or charity to uh, you know the, the, the poorer people and the poor people came to the Holy Prophet وسلم, and they said Ya Rasulullah we can't keep up with these people who are constantly giving more than us obviously there was a atmosphere of fasta bikul khairat so the Holy Prophet وسلم, said to them then the option for you is to I mean the, 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 the parallel or the equivalent of this is to say subhanallah 33 times alhamdulillah 33 times and Allah Akbar 34 times it's a separate issue that afterwards they came up to the Holy Prophet ﷺ and said that the rich people are doing the same. But obviously the Holy Prophet ﷺ gave equivalence and that can only be done through uh, a leadership like I said. Uh, Kudusab, we've received, uh, like I said, quite a number of questions. Uh, Shumaila Sahiba from Putney has asked that some Orientalists like Karen Armstrong and John Estuito allege that before claiming prophethood, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam took part in robberies. Uh, can you please clarify this? Well, I don't know. I, I haven't read the book of um, John Estuito, but I don't think this is the case because I've, I've read many other Orientalist books, especially the likes of Montgomery Watt, um, Muir, George Sell, and none of them deny the fact that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was Siddiq and Amin. I've just pulled out a reference from another Orientalist, if, right. if, I, if you've got time. Yeah, uh, this is from Annie Besant, who, who and she writes in, in a book called The Life and Teachings of Muhammad She says, It is impossible for anyone who studies the life and character of the great prophet, prophet of Arabia, who knows how he taught and how he lived, to feel anything but reverence for that mighty prophet, one of the great messengers of the Supreme. And although in what I put to you, I shall say many things which may be familiar to many, yet I must my myself feel whenever I reread them, a new way of admiration, a new sense of reverence for the mighty Arabian teacher. I mean, if, uh, God forbid, he, he was a robber, <laughs> then I don't think these words would have been coming out of an Orientalist. Brilliant. I mean, I, but I was thinking that she might be, I mean, uh, Shamayla Saiba might be referring to the, um, I mean, like, the Mali Ghanima, the war booty which came in to hand, I mean through the wars, uh, the Holy Prophet maybe. It's very clear that before Prophethood, I mean we're talking about before Prophethood, this was right, not the case. Exactly. Even with Mali Ghanima, that, uh, it's not the case in, 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 in that sense either, that he did not uh, rob anything. That was his right because these are the people, these were the people who persecuted Islam and once they came into war with Islam, once they lost like any other army, they, uh, the Muslim army also had the right uh, to take what, what was rightfully theirs because they conquered that place. So if it was about uh, the booty or, uh, of, of war, then again, it would be a, a legitimate allegation. And obviously we see before, I mean, if it's specifying prior to the Prophethood of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in a pact, was in a, was in a group which was specifically made, Hilf al Fazul, which was specifically made to give, back, to hand over the rights, the, the, the wealth which had been looted. So, I mean, it's quite the opposite actually. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took that money which was robbed and handed it back to the people who it rightly belonged to. Uh, Farhad Sahib Nurul Ain uh, Sahiba uh, has asked uh, from the United Kingdom, she has asked that the, during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how did the companions react if someone mocked uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Um, it's not a matter of if someone attacked or mocked the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many people did, in fact, exactly. mock the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not just in Mecca but even in Medina, where the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did have power. For instance, a Jew came to the uh, went to a companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said that. Um, and they had an argument between each other that who is more superior, Hazrat Moses Islam, or Hazrat Rasul Akram the Holy Prophet And the Jew was uh, saying that Hazrat Moses is more superior and the Muslim was of course saying that the Holy Prophet Muhammad is uh, superior. So the, they took their argument to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and he told them, do not give me precedence over the over Hazrat Moses wasalam. So the Holy Prophet wasalam, respected the feelings of others. Now also there is a, also another example which comes to my mind with the um, with relation to the reaction of the companions of the Holy Prophet wasalam, 
in Mecca when uh, the Holy Prophet وسلم, once when he was uh, when he had bowed down and uh, sorry when when he was praying the Meccans they tied a rope around the Holy Prophet وسلم, and was strangling the Holy Prophet وسلم. at that time Hazrat Abu Bakr came along and he saw this and he m pushed them away from the Holy Prophet did he use violence against them of course not he just said do you punish do you make a person suffer who only calls 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 you guys to God Almighty that was the reaction of the companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped his companions from using any kind of violence because other people mocked the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could that could have done that very easily but we see that the reaction of the companions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were the same as the reaction of the followers of the Imam of the latter days they similar we are similar we are similar in our actions as to the companions of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where we do not use violence against those who uh, mock the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but we try to highlight the beauty of the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that's what the companions of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did as well exactly i mean we're talking about whether the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the opportunity to crush people at the incident of taif the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given the opportunity to crush them with those mountains had any normal human being be it, had he been given that opportunity to crush those people, he would have definitely, I mean, without any doubt, he would have crushed those people within an instance and we wouldn't find those people. But the Holy Prophet ﷺ said, no, from among their progeny, maybe, some people might accept Islam. And that, I mean, that message has so much power in it. I mean, it doesn't need to be no, explained any I further. More importantly, it is to note what the Holy Prophet ﷺ himself did rather than exactly. the companions. Because the companions could have made a mistake, but to associate a mistake to the Holy Prophet وسلم, that's unimaginable, right? So to see what the Holy Prophet وسلم, did, that should be our focus. What was the reaction of the Holy Prophet وسلم? Did he use violence? Of course not. Exactly. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has obviously uh, recently, I mean, recently, I mean, a hundred years ago, I mean, in this day and age, he said that when you see that you're in a, uh, a discussion and um, the Holy Prophet وسلم, is being abused in any sort of way, then either rebut those allegations. I think this might be in, in, in accordance with the Quranic injunction as well. If you see that he's being abused, then either reply or then leave that uh, gathering. Because if you don't leave, then you will be a part of uh, that uh, abuse which is being held at the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم. Uh, Shazad Sahib, very briefly, if you can answer. Uh, Usman Sahib from London has asked, uh, uh, did the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fight for Jewish rights like he fought for women's rights? Absolutely. You see, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yes, no doubt, as we have discussed <coughs> previously as well, that he did fight for the rights of the women. And yes, he also fought for among many other rights that he fought for. One of them was, yes, for the other religions as well, for the Jewish and the Christian rights. And we have ample proof of this. And one of the, uh, the most instrumental thing is that, you know, when he... Uh, when he conducted, the, when he migrated to Medina, one of the first things that he did was the, the covenant of Medina, in which he he basically f uh, formed a treaty with the the Jews and the Christians, and in that it clearly states that their their rights will be protected, and how that even at times of fear, the Muslims will help them. Then also we have the um, another uh, aspect of this is, for instance, the uh, the Charter of Freedom that he granted to the uh, the Christians of St. Catherine's Monastery in the 6th Hijri. Again, this, this was particularly focusing the uh, the Christians there. And the Holy Prophet وسلم, you know, um, he, defend, he protected them and gave him his uh, uh, promise that he would protect them and his friends and, his, the, and the rest of the Muslims <coughs> will protect them in every situation. So there's ample proof that yes, the Holy Prophet وسلم, among many other of his uh, uh, you know, his uh, f fighting for the rights for people, one of them was that he protected the religious rights uh, of the Jews and the Christians. Exactly, brilliant. And obviously that's just one name of a movement at that time. The Holy Prophet yes. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, yeah. What you must also remember is that the Holy Prophet of Islam was where he was a spiritual leader of the Muslims. He was also accepted by the Christians and the Jews as the leader of the state as well. So obviously <coughs> there were times where he had to give out punishment as well, but that was in the capacity of being a leader of the state. So if someone committed a war crime, or if they uh, c committed any other uh, public offence or treason or anything like that, then yes, he would hand, out, uh, hand down punishment as well. But yes, overall, he did protect their religious rights. Uh, Fraza, very briefly, if you can. Just briefly. That, uh, even in state of wars, the Holy Prophet looked after the rights of the Christians and the Jews. He gave the rule, he gave the instruction that do not 
destroy any temple or any church of any religion it's in that matter. Yeah, not just Christians and Jews, yeah, it's all religions. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, full stop. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Jazakallah, uh, Farhad Sahib and Shazad Sahib. Kudu Sahib, if you can very briefly answer this question. Danish Sahib from Epson has asked, why did Allah make the Prophet a Prophet at the age of 40? If you can very briefly, we only have a few minutes left. Yeah, jazakallah, Danish Sahib, for your question. Uh, first, I think the answer straight will be that was Allah's will. Uh, but if you're thinking about a worldly aspect, then it's an age of maturity, you know, physically and mentally. And, uh, but it's again down to what I said earlier, it was Allah's will to make him a prophet at that age. But we have to remember that society <coughs> testifies for the truthfulness of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So. Yeah, and in the Quran it says, Hatta balaga shuddahu balaga arba'ina sana. When he reached the, when a person, when a man reaches the age of forty, that is the age of maturity. Jazakallah, gentlemen. Um, we've reached uh, the end of the program, and obviously in today's program we've understood why we should love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how he was significant in every respective way, in every possible way. How he was different to each and every human being and each and every prophet. Uh, all, all of them, I mean, upon all, all of them be peace. Um, but. I mean, obviously, the reaction of Muslims can't be, we can't, obviously, as Shazad Saab said, we can't represent uh, on their behalf what the reactions of Muslims are, I mean, the violent reactions, what we can say, what we can assure on our part as Ahmadi Muslims, we can say that our reaction never has, nor shall it ever be violent in any possible way. Our answer to these um, attacks has always been, Innama ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah, that I complain only of my sorrow and grief to Allah the Almighty, and we leave the responsibility of settling these arguments with Allah the Almighty, and we don't take any, um, you know, we don't take any revenge on uh, the, such people. We merely show our concern for why these people have, why they always constantly want to assert allegations against such a, a, a pious and innocent person, constantly want to, um, you know, burn the anger of Muslims around the world and they just want to see that reaction which obviously I mean is unlawful but they want to see it constantly and that's all they want to do they want to um, burn the anger of the, of, of the Muslims around the world however on the part of those non-Muslims who are adamant in drawing more and more car cartoons against the Holy Prophet وسلم, because they want to prove to the Muslims that we're living in an age of critique and that they want the Muslims to thicken up and man up to these attacks and they want the Muslims to know that um, well, I mean, you know, they want to teach the Muslims how we should live our Islam. For God's sake, try to understand why we, the Muslims, are so hurt when Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is uh, attacked. I mean, constantly you've seen time and time again the reaction has always been the same. You say that we're thin-skinned. You couldn't be further from the truth. Ahmadi Muslims always replicate and exemplify the best possible example of what Muslims should be doing and how they should be reacting. Muslims, I mean, they teach violence, they propagate violence, but the Ahmadi Muslims educate the Muslims, the other Muslims, on how they should re react. Hazrat Khalif al Masih in his Friday sermons constantly admonishes the other Muslims and pray, tells us to pray for the other Muslims that they may understand what the reaction of a true Muslim should be. I mean, we don't impose the respect of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon you. Neither do we impose our religion upon you. We merely request you that please understand who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was before passing a comment against him, before you say anything about the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Pick up a book and read the life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih in his Friday sermon has constantly said, that you should understand and study the biography of the Holy Prophet to um, fully love the Prophet Muhammad and one of those books has been mentioned in a recent Friday sermon by him. I mean, Life of Muhammad was mentioned, which was written by the second successor of the Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad Sahib. You can go into Al-Islam, you can type in the Holy Prophet Muhammad and inshallah you will find information about that. Jazakumullah gentlemen for being with us here today. Until next time on the 11th of November 2012 from all of us here at Beacon of Truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Yeah.